Happy Palm Sunday weekend, everybody. I, my name is Pastor Candice, and I wore my Palm Sunday jacket ready to celebrate what I like to call the Christmas Eve of Easter. Palm Sunday's um, weekend kind of earmarks the beginning of Passion Week. Now, if you have it in your mind that Jesus was drugged to the cross and murdered without his permission, you got it a little bit wrong. Passion Week actually reveals to us this intentional process that Jesus took to walk forward to the cross, surrendering his life as the ultimate sacrifice, knowing that that's the price it would take for you and I to have a chance to know and be in relationship with the Father. Um, so I, I like to kind of earmark this season to, to pause to recognize what Jesus did and to start the celebration early. So we start Easter celebrations today because this is a wonderful time to recognize what God did. So in light of all that, I want to I want to get to the story, guys. I want to talk about when Jesus um, had that triumphant re-entry into Jerusalem. We just watched this video where the, the folks, the crowd, they were laying down the palms. That's where we get the phrase, from, um, from that, the imagery of people laying palms down. That's where we get the phrase Palm Sunday. And I want to read the scriptures and talk to you a little bit about the two different crowds we see during this season. Okay, There's the first crowd we're going to talk about, um, and we're going to call them the people of praise. The first crowd is the people of praise. And if we're kind of doing this comparison thing, we want to be the people of praise. I want to be a person who is marked by deciding to worship Jesus in spirit and in truth with whatever I have on my person. I'm going to worship God with that. And then later on in the story, we see another crowd. Um, and this was the crowd who cried, crucify him. Let's just start. Let's just get into the story. Okay. So um, if you have your Bibles and you're kind of a, a Bible user, a paper Bible, we're going to Luke 19. So you can turn there. You can also find it on YouVersion. Um, if you're watching, it'll be up on the screen. But I encourage you, it helps to learn things when we use more than one resource. So seeing it is good, hearing it is good, writing it, all three of those things together, that is the triple threat of learning. Okay. So Mark your stuff, mark your, your notebook, your, your highlighter, use your highlighter on your, um, your Bible app, and let's get into it. We're going to go in Luke 19. This story is actually told in all four Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all tell this story, and that's not the case for every single story of Jesus, but this was a crucial story because it, um, it made very evident the, the, um, the answer of prophecy, there were so many prophecies about Jesus and this moment, just it just so many prophecies were answered because of what Jesus decided to do. So in Luke 19, starting in verse 28, um, I'm reading, um, yeah, starting in verse 28. After he said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he had come to near Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you'll find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it, bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Like, why are you still in my colt? Um, just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed, found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? Why are you still in my colt? Um, and they said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their coats on their cloaks on the colts, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, the people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. Okay, so this wasn't just like, um, hey, what's that guy doing riding a, uh, a, a donkey, a colt? You know, what was he doing riding this young animal? Um, the people were engaged in this process, and they just start laying down their own jackets, the, the coat right off their back, laying it on the road. And as he was now, this is verse 37, as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of the power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who has come in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. 
Okay, we're going to stop there because I just want to pause and, and recognize a couple different things. Man, so they're laying down their cloaks. In, another, in one of the other Gospels, it says they laid down palm branches as well. And it says that the crowd joined in with the disciples. So there is this catching of an energy as people just started to praise Jesus on his triumphant reentry. Now, I know that Jesus knows what he's about to do. He's on his last week of being alive. Now, when I think about what I would do, have you ever done this? Like, what would I do if I knew I had one more week to live? Have you ever had these questions? Like you're sitting around the bonfire asking questions of your friend. What would you do on your last day? I could tell you, <laughs> it wouldn't be this list that Jesus spends his last week doing. Jesus, this triumphant re-entry actually begins this really rapid fire season of calling out um, people, healing people. This He kind of goes straight from the triumphant re-entry. He, he weeps at seeing Jerusalem, knowing that they don't truly know what's going on. He just weeps at them because they're lost. Um, he goes and he turns the tables <laughs> in the temple because they're using um, the temple to benefit themselves. Um, he curses a fig tree. He um, goes and he tells the, the Pharisees that tax collectors and prostitutes, they're entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. He goes and he tells the, the chief priests parables. And then the chief priests, that's when they say, hey, he's talking about us. We're the bad guys here. Um, he, he tells people, Everybody's invited, but few are chosen. So he's like narrowing the way. He's in this process. Jesus is in this savage moment where he is not trying to say, hey, everybody come. He's actually setting a really high standard, setting an incredibly high standard. He just goes through this process of setting a super high standard. He's actually, he actually calls the, the Pharisees, you hypocrites. Why are you trying to trap me when they're asking him questions? I'm just like, as I'm reading these verses in between this first crowd and the second crowd, it makes sense how we get to the second crowd because Jesus isn't playing. He ain't messing around. He's not trying to be nice to these guys and these, these leaders of the church and these leaders of the, the law. And he's not trying to be nice anymore or coy or hidden in his message. He's calling them out on repeat. Their hypocrisy, their, their closed-mindedness to the poor and disenfranchised, um, the way that we're not actually loving. He actually boils down the commandments. He's like, I see you doing all these things, but really what you need to do is love God and love people. He he gives them the seven woes to the Pharisees, just like, woe is this, woe is this. And so then we see all of a sudden, you know, when you're reading the Bible, there's a, the little headliners of what you're about to read. Then we see the plot to kill Jesus. And I'm like, well, duh. You know, like Jesus goes on this rampage, kind of setting up the scene of his kingdom ways that do not line up with the comfort and authority and power set up, set up in that current day. What he had set up is in complete opposition of what they had set up. So of course, they plot to kill him. So then um, it says, then there's a story about the woman who washed Jesus' feet. And that was the last straw for Judas. Okay, so he, they had heard all these things. Jesus like, and Judas witnesses him allowing a prostitute come and touch his feet and pour out expensive perfume on his feet. And he's like, oh, no, nah, I'm done with this. And that's what, that's like the, the act that propels him to go and betray Jesus. It was not this all of a sudden thing. It was this, this intentional um, Jesus rubbing people the wrong way. Okay, he wasn't ending on this soft, quiet note. He was ending making sure everybody knew what he was about. And then that brings us to Luke chapter 23. This is the second crowd, and I'm going to refer to them often as the mob because there's a, quite a mob mentality when we look at this crowd and how they engaged um, both with each other, with their leaders, with the, um, gosh, with the uh, governmental leaders, and with Jesus. And so this is Luke 23, starting in 14, uh, verse 13. Pilate called together the chief priests, the leaders, the people. And he said to them, you brought me this man as one who was perverting the people. And here I examined him in your presence and I found the man not guilty of any of your charges. So this is a government official who's trying to do his due diligence to the law. And he's like, yeah, he ain't done nothing. You know, like what, what's the complaint? Um, and he says, neither is Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he's done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore, I'll have him flogged and release him. He's trying to appease the people because he's feeling the energy of the crowd. 
There was an energy of the crowd when Jesus first came in, and that energy was praised. There is an energy of this crowd that he's feeling the need to appease by at least flogging him, even though he verbally admits in text and out loud to this crowd that he has done nothing wrong. But I'm going to go ahead and have him flogged just to make you happy. Verse 18, then they all shouted out together, away with this fellow, release Barabbas for us. This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. So he's like, kind of like, are you sure? But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said to him, why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he would be crucified and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder. And then he handed Jesus over as they wished. When I look at these two groups, okay, so we have the crowd, the people of praise, and then we have this mob. Um, there are some things that, gosh, when I really, really boil down to it, as I read scripture, I can identify things in myself that look like the people of praise. But quite frankly, I can identify stuff in myself that looks like the mob. And because of that, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, as I read these scriptures, I have to make sure that I, I um, consistently redeem that, that I consistently turn that over to the Lord. The things that would, re, that would uh, release me to mob-like behavior, um, it's, it's inside all of us. It's inside all of us. And so if we read these two stories, um, these two batches of scripture, we're like, well, I'm people of praise. You know, I will never be a mob. Like we're probably lying to ourselves. So I just want to invite you, <laughs> just like I had to invite myself to have um, an honest understanding of where we stand. Yes, I want to be a person of praise. And I work on that all the time. But quite frankly, if I don't work on it all the time, the natural tendency is for me to be a person in the mob. Okay, not like a mobster, but like a person in the crowd who's calling for things that are actually self-seeking, okay? And so as I look at these two, um, I want to just give a couple of descriptions of how we can identify if our current behavior, if our current attitude, if our current actions, which group they line up with. People of praise are not dependent on comfort, and we see that when they choose to take off their cloak and lay it at the feet of Jesus. That means that they, um, and the thing about the people who are the people of praise is these are actually a conquered people. These crowds, the crowds that were in the beginning, they were, they were conquered by the Roman Empire. So they were under subjugation to people who are not allowing them to live freely, their own traditions. So like they were a conquered people. Um, and so their praise was not dependent on their freedom. Their praise was not dependent on their comfort. If we want to be a people of praise, we have to start to make sure that our praise is lined up with things that are constant. And the only constant in this world is Jesus. Jesus Christ. Okay, because your freedom is not constant. Your comfort is not constant. We need to be a people who lay down our cloaks before the Lord. What are the things that are important to you that you're laying down before the Lord? If you're a people of praise, you'll be laying down things on a regular basis. There are things that I laid in. I laid down um, my dependence on my finances. I lay that down before the Lord. Lord, I will not depend on this bank account. I will not depend on um, the health in my body because any of these things can be taken in a second. Any of those things can be taken in a second. Man, um, during this season, this has been a year, right? This has been a hard year. And um, this year has revealed to me some areas that my feet have been off the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Okay, just to be <laughs> kind of blunt and honest, like I have been shaken a little bit because I realized that my feet were on some other things. And when those things were shaken, I was shaken because my feet were on the wrong stuff. And the people of praise, their, their praise is not dependent on their comfort. When our praise is dependent on us getting good stuff, as soon as we stop getting good stuff, we'll stop praising. And I want to ask you, is your praise depending on how we call blessings? Sometimes I woke up this morning and the Lord just reminded me, your stuff is not your only blessing. I'm your blessing. So if we're looking at our stuff as our blessing, when we look at people in a third world country, are they still blessed? You know, when we start to attach blessings to stuff, our blessings can be dried up. 
there is something deeper to what a real blessing is. Yes, we are blessed with things. Yes, that's a blessing. But gosh, I know for sure the enemy uses it to distract us and to keep us comfortable. And as soon as we get distracted and comfortable by the enemy, we stop being people of praise. We stop being people of praise and we'll start to have, pe- we'll start to have complaints. We'll start to have um, a desire for stuff that's greater than the desire for the Lord. One of my favorite verses says to seek first his kingdom and then all these things will be given to you. So man, there is a blessing that comes with worshiping the Lord, but the blessing comes from seeking first his kingdom. It doesn't come from seeking first finances, um, fame, uh, um, things that please the flesh. It doesn't come from that. So if you want to be a people of praise, you got to you got to recognize your dependency on comfort. We are comfortable people, especially in the West. We are a comfortable people, and when our comfort gets shaken, so does our praise. And we got to recognize that for what it is. If we want to be a people of praise, we cannot be dependent on comfort. The Lord actually says, pick up your cross. Like that is not a comfortable call. He's like, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross. You're like, I will once I, the cross is more cozy. Like, no, we're not. He didn't, he didn't give us a cozy cross. He's not giving us a cozy cross. He has called us to live in a place of sacrifice and surrender. Those are not comfortable terms. And if we set up our entire Christian life to be the most comfortable place it could ever be, we're actually probably just putting our feet on stuff that's not the solid rock of Jesus which calls us to praise him no matter how comfortable we are. Okay, people of praise, they recognize God in his rightful place. So the things that they were calling out were actually identifying God for who he was. They were more focused on God than they were focused on themselves or on the people around them. They were not focused on man. Okay, so I wanna talk about this God focus versus man focus. And so the crowd, that first crowd, as you read some of the other stories, I would encourage you, go read the other gospels. Read the same batch of scripture in the other perspectives. It's so interesting how much you learn, okay? Um, But the crowd, they had just seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the tomb. A lot of those people were a witness to that incredible miracle. Lazarus had been dead for four days. Like, that's crazy. He was smelly, you know, like, they're like, don't raise him up. He's going to be smelly, Jesus. But he raised him up. And so these people had this fresh understanding, realization of who this man was. Okay. So they realized who he was. They realized what he could do. They realized that he was sovereign God. He is sovereign God. And so when we realize the sovereignty of God, it sets us up a little bit different on how we think about the rest of life. When God is seen as sovereign and he's in charge of everything, us, people, systems, the planet, he is sovereign over all, that releases us from responsibility for choosing. Now there's this thing that's happening right now where people are trying to dictate and choose how God is. And it makes me nervous. It makes me realize, man, we might become more man-focused than God-focused because we're, we're um minimizing the sovereignty of God because I'm choosing how I want my Jesus to be. We don't get to pick. We don't get to choose who Jesus is, how Jesus is, what he has called us to do. He has already sent forth his call for us. He's already dictated the way, the truth, and the life. And I don't get to decide that there is another way. If I'm good enough, then I'll still get in. As long as I'm spiritual enough, I'll still get in. We don't get to pick because God is sovereign. If we ever lose the sovereignty of God in our imagination as, we are, um, as we're engaging with life, we will start to put ourselves first. We will start to put our own thoughts first. God is God and we are not. So to be a people of praise, we must keep God in his rightful place. To remember what he's done. To remember who he is. Now, the fear of God is not um, fear in the way that we should be afraid of certain things, okay? The fear of God, having that reverence and that acknowledge, acknowledgement of his sovereignty is actually just a, a, an awareness. It's living like he's in the room. Have you ever walked into a room like with your kids and they didn't know you were there and so they hide something? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, have you ever done that? And you're just like, oh, I see you. You know, it's kind of silly them trying to hide. Like, oh, hi, mom. You know, <laughs> my kids have done that before and they're like, hi. And they think that I can't tell they're hiding something behind their back. And I'm like, you foolish child. You know, no, I'm just kidding. But, but really like, what do you have behind your back? You know, <laughs> you do the things. And I feel like that's how it is sometimes. We're like, oh, God can't see. God can't see me do this. Oh, he doesn't know what I'm posting on my social media. He don't read Twitter. You know, like we just think that God, he's not aware. We're not aware of his presence all the time. 
We're not aware of his presence. When I, when I recognize that I have dropped the awareness of God's presence in my life 100% of the time, I, I stop acting like he's watching. I stop acting like he cares about what I do, what I say, where I look, um, where I spend my money. So the fear of God is a never ending awareness and reverence of God's presence and his authority. Okay, and I want to read you this verse in Psalms 36 because it just so perfectly um, helps us not to trade fear of God for a fear of man. Fear of God is where we need to be. Fear of man, not so much. Okay, and so this verse um, dictates that. It says, I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. If there is no fear of God before their eyes, in their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. The words of their mouths are wicked and deceitful. They fail to act wisely or do good. Even on their beds, they plot evil. They commit themselves to sinful course and they do not reject what is wrong. When we stop having a fear of God, we stop seeing the wrong things we do. We think that it's justified. I can justify saying that because I feel this way. When we stop having a fear of the Lord, we, we stop seeing sin. If we stop seeing sin, we, we stop heading towards righteousness and holiness and love. So keep that healthy fear of God and you will stay a people of praise. Now I'll tell you this, the mob, okay? That mob mentality can result from mindlessness. Okay, when we lose our minds, have you ever lost your mind? Like, I lost my mind. Whenever we say we lost our mind, it is never a positive thing. It's not like, I lost my mind, I was so great. You know, like, no, no, no. We lost our mind, so we did something that was mindless. It was probably negative, right? Um, I wanna show you guys this video of some people who they obviously, they're not thinking through their actions. They're being, they are not thinking it through when you can tell, and they're just following the crowd. Check this out. Run. Run. would do in that situation if someone was just running at me maybe I would be like uh, I don't know it I don't need to be told I'm gonna run too <laughs> and so I don't know but it just kind of depicts like sometimes this is what we do like even even on the positive guys even on the positive we might be in church and we're like oh uh, they're singing and raising their hands uh, me too what, what is that I'm, I'm gonna raise my hands too you know like sometimes we can be convinced by the crowd to do things that are actually in our in our benefit but we don't understand why and if we stop there and we just keep raising our hands and we don't really know why, we're just like everybody else raise our hands. We have now stepped out of being a people of praise and we're back into the mob, even though we're doing good things. And I just want to encourage you. We don't have to be mindless in how we live. We don't have to be mindless in our choices. Like what are the most people doing? That's what I'll do. Like that's not how God has called us. He has called us to lead and to charge new courses, to make sure that we're using our mind, our, our words, our heart, our emotions. They all play a part, but we're not to be mindlessly following what everybody's doing. We're, we're called to be very focused on what the Lord has taught us, how he's revealing himself to us and intentionally making steps, not mindlessly following anybody, anybody. We should be mindfully following Christ. Okay. And so this is the people of praise. This is the thing. They were asking questions. Who is this guy? Um, I don't know if that's the translation I read or the, um, the, the telling I, I told earlier, but there's one of the verses in either Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John where they're like, who's this guy? Why are you guys praising? What, what's going on? Like they weren't just like, uh, yeah, me too. Hosanna. You know, like they were like, what, what, what is happening? And they're like, Oh, he raised a man from the dead. He probably is God. Let me say Hosanna. There is a thoughtful process for how this crowd grew because there was an awareness. There was a mindfulness. Now the mob, gosh, Pilate was trying to ask them, what are you guys doing? Why do you want to do this? He threw out questions many times and not once did they answer. And they just kept saying, crucify him, 
crucify him. There was just such a, a centralized focus that disregarded their thought process for what was happening. And so then this is what they did. They decided to, um, to release a murderer instead of a person who had literally never done a single thing wrong. That is crazy, obviously crazy. But in that moment, they didn't see it as crazy because they were walking forward mindlessly listening to one another and these leaders who had put a word in their mouth. They had put a word in their mouth that, that um, led them to going away against what, um, going against Jesus. And so I just want to tell you, 1 Peter 3.15 tells us, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to answer to anyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So this verse is telling us two things, okay? Number one, have an answer. Don't be mindless. Don't just be like, I love Jesus. Why? I don't know. You know, like you should know. And if you don't know today, that's okay. But guess what? You're alive. So that means you have time to figure it out. Why are you following Christ? Let me tell you guys something. There is this, this surge of people who are asking questions, but they're asking questions in the wrong way. And the way that we ask questions, if we ask questions of people who don't love Jesus and we start to follow that, it's not going to lead us back into the fold and the power of God's creation and his, his family. Okay, so learning to ask questions well as believers is so important. Okay, so we're, we're called to ask questions. We're called to wonder and to seek after the answers and be prepared with your own story. Do you know why you follow? Do you follow because your parents follow? If you follow because your parents followed, you've always followed. You need, to put, you need to fill in that blank. You need to do the work because if you don't do the work, the enemy is doing the work of making sure you feel insecure in your faith, that you feel mindless in your faith. And then eventually you'll be too embarrassed to ask and you'll drop off. And so do not be a mindless Christian. Be somebody who always has an answer, no matter what. So we should be, we should be a studied people. Okay, that doesn't mean you got to like read all the things, but we just need to have an answer. This is why I believe this. Okay, this is why I'm behaving this way. This is why I'm sending my money this way. This is why I'm voting this way. We should have an answer. Okay, and some of those answers, they take time. So there's a lot of things where I still got a blank, but I don't have a blank for why I have my hope in Christ. That is a solid answer. And I can tell you in two seconds, like this is why my hope is in Christ because he has saved me. He has restored me. He has transformed my life. He has transformed the history of my family. I look back and I see where my family would have been if Jesus hadn't redirected my path and how many times he's healed me and restored me and been there for me in my, my moments of most um, highest terror. He has been there and his perfect peace has cast out fear in a way that I could not explain that my hope is in Jesus, and I know that confidently. So let's not be mindless Christians, and let's not be a mindless mob. And last but not least, mobs are characterized by unbridled emotions. When I say unbridled, I mean, um, like I think about the bridle of a horse, like it is um, something that steers, okay? Now I wanna, I wanna caution this. I do not believe that emotions are bad, okay? Like I couldn't because I literally cry. Like you can ask the staff at church, like I cry every Tuesday when we have staff meeting because I love everything we do and I love Jesus and I cry all the time and I'm just like, I love Jesus. And they're like, okay, Kenneth, I cry. So emotions are not bad, but I will tell you, my emotions are not in charge and my emotions are not a sign of truth. Okay, if my emotions were a side of truth, then I would be a crazy person because my emotions tell me all sorts of stuff. My emotions would tell me that I should be afraid there. I should be um, angry there. I should, you know, my emotions are, it actually, there's a verse um, that says that, you know, your heart is deceitful. So our heart, our emotions, they actually are flaring up in ways that they shouldn't. And we are called to be people of self-control where I may have emotions, I may feel emotions, but I always, those are surrendered to Christ too. My emotions are surrendered to Christ. And when we have unbridled emotions, it actually sets us up for the enemy to work in our emotions. When our emotions are running rampant, they are controlling our lives. All of a sudden, the enemy has a steering wheel, has a steering wheel into our spirit. It says in Proverbs 25, 28, a man without self-control or a woman is like a city broken into and left without walls. It's that, um, it's that lack of protection. And I want to tell you guys a story real quick that um, a couple weeks ago, maybe it was a, um, like a month ago, something happened in my life. Again, this has been a year. 
something happened in my life that made me angry. <laughs> and um, it wasn't just kind of like, man, I'm mad, kind of angry. This was a type of angry. Honestly, I haven't been this angry in a long time. I would say years. Okay, This was like the most angry I had been in a long time. Um, I cried probably for around three hours. Like my tears most of the time, are ang they were angry tears. I was angry. I was very, very mad. And so my husband came in and he was like, wow. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm mad. And so he came and I like did my thing. I like vented real good. And I will tell you, I wasn't doing the, the work of the Lord of, uh, of, of honing in my anger. I was letting it fly. Okay. I'd gotten to a point where all of a sudden my anger was out of control. <laughs> And I repented since then so I can tell the story with, uh, with honesty. Um, but in that moment of incredible anger, um, I, I kind of had to separate myself from my family because I was raging. And I got embarrassed a little bit. And um, I go into the bathtub and, you know, I'm just kind of sitting there crying. I, I feel like in the shower is like the best place to cry because then the fears are just like their shower tears and it's okay. It makes you feel less crazy. But I'm crying. Um... And then right after my husband kind of checks on me, he's like, are you okay? And I said words that I've literally never once said before. I said, I think that I'm too much and I'm going to quit. This moment of unbridled anger had let words from the enemy become my words. I have never once doubted that the Lord has placed me where he has placed me until all of a sudden I let my anger be in charge. When my anger is in charge, the enemy has an open door. And all of a sudden I was speaking words that were not words from the Lord. The Lord has never said that I'm too much. <laughs> the Lord has never said you're not called to serve these people. But because of my unbridled anger, because I just let it fly for hours and hours and hours, and I just stewed and stewed and turned and turned, all of a sudden the enemy was able to whisper to me and I said it out loud. And then immediately, because I have a, a history with Jesus, because I have a confidence in who he is, and I have placed my feet on his solid word, not only the word of God, but his word of God, the word of God for my life, I said, whoa, 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 <laughs> enemy. As soon as it left my mouth, I recognized it. I was like, let me pause. Let me quiet my spirit for a moment. And let me head back into the fight. A moment of unbridled anger had caused me to, um, to step out. And I'm mad at the devil about it, <laughs> to be quite frankly. Frank, to be frankly honest, I'm angry with the devil for that. And I said, I see you. I see you using something. I had surrendered a little bit of my, you know, the armor of God. I had surrendered it. And he immediately took that opportunity. I spoke these words. I said, you know what? Now <laughs> you ain't getting me off this horse because I am going to fight with all that I have to make sure that his kingdom will come in Kings County. There is no getting me off this without the direct call of the Lord. I see you enemy. And now I got a, now I got a glimpse of your plans. Okay. So because I'm a person of praise, I'm going to recognize where the enemy tries to work, okay? But if I allowed myself to be like a mob, where I get to be um, emotional and everything, where I get to make emotional decisions, where I get to be, um, where those emotions get to dictate my next move, I'll be out of the game, dude. This is hard. This is hard. And I just want to tell you that if your emotions during this season has caused you to take a back seat to your calling on being a disciple maker. I'm gonna encourage you to put a um, bridle on those emotions, to put a reminder in your mouth of who you are called to be. Now, here's the thing, being a crowd, being a part of the crowd is not bad. Make sure it's the right crowd, okay? Because God has called us in 1 Peter 2, 9, that you are a chosen people. You're not a chosen person. We are a chosen people. Our relationship with each other is a part of the plan of God. We don't get to do this by ourselves. That's not an option. I hear a lot of people be like, well, I'm, I'm going to be a Christian, but I'm not going to do church because that's really hard. Yeah, it's hard because we're broken people. Okay, we're, we're being broken all up on each other. Of course it's hard. But I will tell you, you are not called on your own. You are called to be a people. You are called to be in the family. You're called to be in the body. So it says you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. You are called to be a person of praise. We are called to be a people of praise. Let's not let our comfort distract us. 
Let's not let our emotions get us out of the game. Let's not let mindlessness get us off track. Let's not have our eyes focused on man. Let's keep our eyes focused on the one who made it all and who is leading the charge. You are called. You are called to be a people. You are called to be a people in the family. Yeah, we're broken. <laughs> yeah, we're going to hurt each other. Yeah, we're going to get each other so mad we're crying in the shower. We're going to do that. But praise the Lord. God is good. He is good even in the middle of all that hurt. He is good in the middle of your discomfort. He is good in the middle of your confusion. And He is calling you to a higher place. He is calling you to a place of ownership so that we would be crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. God is good all the time. Not just when I'm comfortable, not just when I understand, not just when I want to, but God is good all the time. So I'm gonna pray with you that we would be a people of praise no matter what. Okay, pray with me. Just put a hand on your heart. Because sometimes when we do things in the physical world, it like lines up my, my spiritual self. Lord, with our hands on our hearts right now, God, I pray that you would help us to be a people of praise. God, I pray for mercy, for the mob mentality that sometimes takes over, for the times when our emotions make us say things against Jesus or th say things against people or say things against the church. God, that we say things, we do things out of emotion. God, we do things mindlessly. God, help us to be good stewards of our mind, of our bodies, of everything that you've given us so that we are people of praise no matter what. God, help us to have a right understanding of your blessings that we wouldn't feel put off because we don't have as much as our neighbor, that that wouldn't be a qualifier for how good you are, that we don't have as much. God, that that wouldn't make us feel less than or unworthy or uncalled because we have less things, God. I pray that we would always have a healthy perspective, that we would always be pursuing you. God, I pray for a salvation moment right now for somebody who hasn't felt um, invited. God, I pray that they would understand that the, the, the invitation is huge, that the invitation is huge for every person to be in your kingdom. God, there is one way. There is only one way, Lord. And I pray that we would never confuse the way with the way that the mob is trying to get us to believe right now, God, that we would know that the way is through you, my Lord, and that we would be passionate about making sure that everybody knows the way, that everybody knows the way to actual truth, actual joy, actual peace, Father. Speak to us in our homes right now or in our cars, wherever we are. Help us to experience your goodness and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. I love how Pastor Candace brings the word, uh, how much passion she demonstrates for the importance for us to be the kind of people that, that decide continually to bring praise to the Lord. And You know, that all begins with a relationship with Christ. Uh, living our life every single day for the one who gave his life for us so that we might have life in him. That's what it's all about. And if you don't have that kind of relationship, I mean, I don't know what your experience is of Jesus, of uh, understanding who he is. Maybe you have been in the church or connected with the church for a long time, or maybe this is all new to you. Wh wherever you stand today, I want to say the very first thing you have to do, the business that you have to take care of, is deciding who you're going to worship, deciding who you're going to be in the crowd. Are you going to live your life for someone other than yourself? Are you going to live your life for the one who won our life and gave it to us. And, and if today you're ready to make that decision, I just wanna say Jesus not only offers himself, but welcomes you in to relationship with him. And it begins with you simply saying, you know what, I'm gonna give up my way. Uh, I've, I've decided that I'm no longer going to do things in the way that I think is best. And I'm gonna come to Jesus and say, Lord, would you please forgive me for, for doing things in the wrong way. Would you forgive me, Lord, for all of the things that I have done, said, the things that I've carried, the way that I have gone? And would you now take my life? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my life to you so you can give your life to me. And, and it just begins with, with a prayer. And, and if you're ready, I want to encourage you to pray that prayer. I'm going to say it very simply and very shortly. And how, wherever you're at right now, I would just encourage you to pray this with me. Make these words your own. You can repeat them or you simply can whisper them to the Lord. The most important thing is not the words. The most important thing is your heart and your understanding that you're giving everything to Him and inviting Him 
And so if you would pray with me, Jesus, today in this moment, we give ourselves to you. We recognize, I recognize, Lord, I need you, that my way has only led to death, that the things that I have done, Lord, are, are, are full of brokenness and sin. And I've come to an end of myself and I'm asking you, Jesus, would you forgive me? Would you give me your life? Would you, me, would you give me your way? Would you change me, God, from the inside out? I, I need you, Lord, and I receive today by faith the life that you promise to all those who follow you. Would you make me new? Would you give me a fresh start? Lord, would you walk with me day in and day out? In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, uh, in, in the honesty of your heart, what you did is you just, you began a relationship with Christ and it's a new life, but it's a process of growing in that new life. Every new plant has to be tended and cared for. And we want to encourage you, this is a start, it's not everything. And so you have to begin to walk now in this new relationship. We'd like to do that along with you and encourage you in that. If you would text the, the name Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, -S, to the number that's on the screen, we'll just begin to send you a series of text messages. There's just, I think, five or six of them, one for every day that I've prepared for you. And it'll help you begin to go deeper in your relationship with Christ. Of course, you need to come back uh, and, and watch service next week. You need to get involved in a church. You need to build relationships with others. But it all begins right now in this place with what God has done in your life. Whatever you're dealing with today, we wanna to pray with you. And uh, if you would like prayer, we're available in the chat. If you're watching this live, please let us know. Just type in the chat so that we can pray with you. We've got people that are ready to do that. And if you're watching this afterwards, you just can email us to pray, I'm sorry, prayer at caseyhanford.com uh, so that we can lift those prayer requests up to the Lord with you. Thank you for being with us today. We hope that you're encouraged. We hope that you're blessed. We're excited that God is on the move. He's not finished with us. He's working things out in our favor. We believe that, and I believe the best is yet to come. God bless you.